Good morning, everyone. This is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society Saturday uh, meetings. And uh, today we have Ian Cohen, and uh, we're going to be discussing uh, some more about uh, unipolar induction. And uh, I'd like to like to remind everyone that this video is sponsored by the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. We're currently having a fundraiser. And uh, so if you could uh, look us up and uh, make a donation, I appreciate it. You can also uh, join the society. And if you are a member, uh, please also make sure to remember to uh, pay your the yearly, do, the yearly dues. But uh, today we have uh, Ian Cohen, and uh, and we're going to just let you go on your presentation here, okay? Thank you very much for the introduction, Franklin. And uh, good, good day to everybody. Uh, you're most welcome. Thank you for attending this. Um, as Franklin has intimated, we have been looking at this set, uh, subject of electromagnetic induction, and in particular unipolar induction for some weeks. We had two presentations from Harry Ricker, um, and um, he, he, he was going into all the various theories and, and, and how they appear to contradict each other. And nevertheless, they, they claim to um, comply with, with, with experimental results and not contradict them and so on. And it was a very confused area. He was um, Then we had Bob Gray uh, uh, giving us a presentation on uh, uh, a subject that he has um, concentrated on for some time, Weber electronics, which is an alternative to Maxwell's electronics. And then he he uh, he looked at how you may apply uh, Weber electronics to unipolar induction. And last week, just to remind you, Harry was due to give uh, a further talk, uh, going into a little more detail on Faraday's original experiments of about 170 years ago in the 1850s. Now, unfortunately, that <coughs> excuse me, that had to be aborted. Uh, owing to bandwidth problems. So we, we, we just engaged, a few of us engaged uh, in the green room in a, a conversation, which may be well, wor worth looking at. Um, uh, so we're hoping to have ca Harry back again when the bandwidth problems are, are, are resolved. But anyway, thank you very much. Uh, this week, I'm um, <clears throat> giving a, a little talk on Kelly's experiments on unipolar induction. So uh, Al Kelly during the, the, the mid-1990s onwards, for about three years, was engaged in doing some experiments, and um, he, he came to some results. And uh, I'll be going through those in some detail, uh, because um, a number of people have expressed to me the, uh, the view that uh, Kelly's uh, writings or, or ideas are, are not very clear. A number of people have said that to me, and and yet I, I I find quite the contrary. I find he's very clear. I can understand totally what he's saying. So uh, this um, this talk is a is a humble attempt to try to explain everything. I'm not sure why I might have a greater insight into Kelly's writings than other people do. Um, perhaps it's because I attended some of his lectures in the 1990s. Perhaps it is because of our common nationality which enables me to interpret, so to speak, some of his Irishisms. I don't know what it is, but I'm hoping anyway, by going through his paper, to explain uh, his thesis. So perhaps 80% of my talk will be on that. Now, Kelly did make some suggestions as to how we might go further and maybe get a more general law, which would be applicable in all cases. And I, I, maybe the last 20% uh, of my lecture will be attempting to do that. Kelly was actually a very uh, careful experimenter, and, and he, in my to my mind, he was a clear thinker. I hope you'll agree uh, after today's talk. Um, but he, he, he had um, mathematical ability, but I wouldn't claim that he was a mathematician. He, so <laughs> he, he suggested how one might go forward, forward analytically, but he actually said, well, that's for others to do. Now, I, I've perhaps attempted to do that with the aid of some of the earlier work of J.P. Wesley, on electromagnetic induction. Um, yeah, so um, so if I could be considered in a very, very minor way to be the Maxwell to his Faraday, uh, I, I'd be very honored. So there's the introduction. Now, 
Um, just very briefly, uh, there's a picture of, of Al Kelly. So as I say, to look at the experiments over a three-year period uh, on electromagnetic induction, his, his conclusions related to unipolar induction. Now, Kelly, um, electromagnetic induction, unipolar, homopolar induction, Faraday's paradox. Uh, Kelly uh, was um, a, a, a manager in uh, the, the Electricity Generation Board uh, of the Republic of Ireland. He subsequently uh, became chairman of a, a branch of a consultancy branch of that uh, dealing with international consultancy and um you know they had a number of projects i think he was it was it's claimed that that he was um maybe the first to have implemented a commercial combined uh, cycle uh, generation system um it, for, for 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 gas and steam turbines um in the south of ireland and that that was maybe um promulgated or, or put into other areas in in the middle east i think they did a lot of consultancy there but anyway he retired from there um i don't know maybe early to mid 90s um and he um he, he had a number of, of endeavors i think the 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 the, the last one was uh, hds energy systems which was like a consultancy uh, area uh, in the energy uh, conversion and transmission area. Now, he had at his disposal, however, a number of technicians from the electricity supply board. And in fact, he, he could not uh, end in singing the praises of, of those technicians. One of them actually had won the uh, award for the best technician of, of the year. So he, he, they did a lot of the work for him. Uh, in constructing the apparatus, which I'll be describing now. Uh, so that was the introduction to uh, to A.G. Kelly. Uh, he died in 2005, and his experiments, uh, what we'll be talking about today, were sort of published in 1998. So the three years prior to that, he was engaged with the technicians in, in, from the electricity board helping uh, him in his in, in his premises in HCS energy systems uh, in, in um, sort of southwest Dublin. That's where the area was. Okay. Now, oh, yes. Um, well, just very, very briefly, uh, a lot of these are sort of repetitions, but um, the, uh, the, the it will be based on two monographs, which he actually... Uh, uh, published uh, under the aegis of the Institution of Engineers of Ireland. I think actually because he couldn't get them published anywhere else. And, and uh, you know, he, he had some, uh, he was a fellow of, of that institution. So he, he pr probably twisted their arms a bit. I perhaps shouldn't say this, but I, I'm not sure if even they understood totally. But anyway, th they did him the honor of, of publishing them under, under their banner. Uh, monograph five and monograph six, 1998. Now, they they were combined into a paper he gave uh, um, in London, uh, this PIRT conference uh, on relativity and, and distant physics, uh, law of relative motion of conductors in 1998. And in particular, uh, a book, Challenging Modern Physics, uh, which some of you I think are aware of um, here, uh, Unipolar Induction, uh, chapter nine is, is the basic reference there. So um, I, I'll just um, give you one more basic reference in my next slide to give you a link to one or two of the things, just in case you, you don't have the papers. Um, so this gentleman by the name of Duncan Cumming uh, has this website, which I think Harry Ricker gave us links to some of these things. And uh, this is one on Varietal Friday. It's very, very useful. So uh, if I click on it, hope to get the link. <clears throat> yeah, uh, his his website is emmanuelavionics.org. He has a consultancy company in California called Emmanuel Avionics. He's an Englishman, actually. He was in Cambridge University. But um, anyway, so if you go into that, uh, emmanuelavionics.org, uh, faraday.htm, you'll get um, a bit of information. Now, he's been most interested in Kelly's works, and he's tried to replicate them. Uh, now, in that, you'll, you'll, you'll see a YouTube video of that, which I, I hope to, to show later on. It's only about seven and a half minutes. Um, there's his own report. Uh, now, the Kelly paper there, for example, just in case you don't have the Kelly paper, 
which is basically the same as the monographs and the chapter in this book. So you can download it there. Bit of information on Kelly if you're interested and some other some other stuff. Um, OK, so, 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 so that that's another reference uh, which this um, this gentleman uh coming has has put up through his um company emmanuel avionics.org now let me see if i get rid of that yeah i'm still in my slides <laughs> well just what one more before we start it's sometimes good in case you all sleep and say oh this is going to be a very boring uh, turgid lecture um it, you know, it's been so difficult, this whole question. And Harry has pointed that out. He, he said uh, Faraday's riddle solve question mark at the end. No, perhaps it wasn't solved. Um, there have been so many of these competing theories which all claim to explain the phenomena, but they're all contradictory. And the experiments have all been done, all the permutations of the experiments and so on. Uh, so sometimes it's a subject... Um, uh, you, you know, uh, Dr. Johnson's uh, biographer, uh, James Boswell, they, they did a tour of the Highlands. Well, let's go to the Giants Causeway next year. And uh, Johnson was, was very, um, uh, he wasn't very enthusiastic about that. And, and uh, Boswell said, but surely the Giants Causeway is worth seeing in a Scottish accent. And uh, Johnson said, worth seeing, yes, but not worth going to see. So sometimes uh, you might feel the same way about this whole question of um, unipolar induction. But I'll be hoping to, to make things clearer. Now, uh, w w just one more thing before I move on, uh, because I just wanted to say this. Um, I I'm hoping to be able to convince some of you who thought that uh, Kelly's uh, ideas were, were, were very difficult and, and not clearly expressed, that they were clear. I think he was a clear thinker and he could get to the nub of a, of a, of a problem, uh, you know, without introducing undue um, uh, complications and special pleading and, and c contrivances, you know, just to fit in with various theories. He certainly didn't do that at all. In fact, he says uh, in his book here, he says, if anybody comes to you and says, that the, 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 you know, in order to understand the unipolar induction, you have to factor in the influence of uh, nebulae millions of light years away uh, on the on the Earth, or you have to engage in a cybernetic uh, interpretation of the special theory of relativity. He said, just don't pay any attention to him because he's talking through his hat. Now, those were two actual examples of of papers of academic people who explained, you know, unipolar induction that way, but Kelly just dismissed it out of hand. So, um, so the first number of slides, I'm just going to copy uh, Kelly's figures and just tell you what he set up uh, in the laboratories of HCS Energy Systems, uh, how they fabricated these, these, uh, these, these pieces of equipment. He did two series of tests, actually, one with a, a magnet and the other with a solenoid. A, a magnet apparatus and solenoid apparatus. This is just for your reference. You know, you have the magnet here. Now, actually, the magnet is 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 of ceramic material, but it has a ferrous um, area here coating. Now, that will be very important because we'll be coming back to that. Just remember that the, the magnet. Uh, what's happened there? Yeah, the the, mag, the magnet has um, uh, a conducting uh, periphery. And um, apart from that, it's ceramic. Uh, it, you have the disc, which is separate there. I'm afraid if I, if I move the wrong thing, I move on to the next slide. But the my cursor, the disc is there. So you have the disc. Now, G Kelly, I think he was maybe the first or one of the first to put this onto a lathe uh, with, with rotating shafts so that you could rotate the whole thing in unison. There were pulleys here. Uh, or, or you could rotate the disc alone or you could take, rotate the magnet alone. Uh, th that was his setup. So, um, and these are the, the um, experiments that Dr. Cumming uh, in, endeavored to, to replicate. We'll talk about that later. The solenoid, okay, disc separate there. Here's the solenoid drive pulleys and so on, 12 volt battery and, and so on. So, uh, just to give you an indication of the, uh, the uh, dimensions. I, I've blown these up to be the same size, but they're not. You can see. Um, you can see the the, the, the the solenoid has a significantly greater length and so on. But other than that, the, the apparatus is the same. 
so he, he, he built this uh, and he said, let's do these experiments again. Now, <laughs> as you'll see later, um, he repeated a lot of uh, uh, Faraday's experiments, which unfortunately uh, Harry has yet to describe to us in detail because um, he was going to give us a talk last week on them. But he, 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 um, he's repeated those. But he's also done some additional experiments which Faraday didn't do. So um, we'll come to those presently. Now, uh, just, just, just to give you, this is really starting from scratch, just to make sure that we haven't forgotten anything, that there are no surprises, because this seems to be a whole question where there are paradoxes. You're getting an EMF where there shouldn't be an EMF. You're not getting an EMF where there should be an EMF. So, so just to make sure we know the results. So, um, you know, with, with the uh, magnet, uh, here's the deflection of the galvanometer because there's a, the galvanometer, the leads are going back from the magnet, which I haven't shown, but I will show those later. The leads are going back to a galvanometer, which is measuring the, the, the small voltage uh, generated. Uh, so here's the deflection of the galvanometer against RPM, the revolutions per minute of the shaft. Uh, so if, um, if the disc is only moving, uh, you, you get um, an increased uh, EMF with the uh, increase of RPM, uh, and it's there. If the uh, magnet and disc are moving, uh, you get that. Now, that's the first paradox. It's even greater voltage, slightly greater voltage, because conventional wisdom is, oh, they're moving in unison, there's no relative motion, therefore there should be no EMF. And here's the second paradox. If the magnet only moves, you get zero EMF, irrespective of the speed of the shaft. And they would say, well, you should get it because you're inducing from the magnet, uh, you know, into the stationary disc. So that's that. And uh, they're similar with the uh, with the solenoid. You know, the, the disc only is up here. The solenoid and the disc uh, is, uh, is greater again, slightly greater. And zero for the solenoid only. So the, the, there, in a nutshell, are the so-called paradoxes of the uh, Faraday um, Faraday generator experiments. Okay, uh, disc disc eight millimeters from magnet. Just we'll we'll return to that later because he do, then does some experiments comparing the results uh, as the disc moves uh, uh, towards the magnet and away from the magnet. So. Uh, so this was just at one at one separation here, okay. Right now the next one, okay. So he said, "Look, you, you might think he's really thrashing this to death, but he said, look, let's have a look at what happens if we decrease the gap between the disc and the magnet. Uh, well, it increases the voltage, as one might imagine. Actually, that that's probably not to say. So the RPM again, the millimeter deflected the galvanometer uh, for different." Um, Separations. So for zero separation, you know, this is basically the Faraday generator because the disc is smack bang up against the magnet. So 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 there's no separation there, and you get the maximum voltage. And then as you um, increase it to 48 millimeters, uh, it, it still rises, of course, but it's it's a lower value. So variation of distance from disk to magnet. So no surprises so far. Well, we, we've encapsulated the two paradoxes, which really we need to we need to explain. If we cannot explain those, we've failed miserably, and um, we're going to endeavour to explain those without having to resort to, you know, cybernetic relativity or galactic uh, motions uh, millions of light years away, or, or uh, dare I say, other ad hoc hypotheses. Okay, now, <clears throat> so we're, we're coming to the end of these sort of preliminary experiments, just to make sure that, that, that nothing is awry with his, his equipment. He's looking at the magnetic flux density uh, versus distance from the rim radially inwards. <laughs> okay, well, you know, it's hard to know. You get slightly different uh, results for the solenoid. For the magnetic um, readings, there's not much difference, actually. Um, so, so the, the 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 magnetic induction is basically changing a little as you go from the the rim radially inwards, uh, but, but there's nothing very substantial there. A bit erratic. Uh, here, they it seems to increase a little actually. 
so at the disc uh at the disc it, it's 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 nothing really and then it increases uh at, at the end plate of the solenoid it's it's it actually increases uh um as you go inwards which is probably not surprising for a solenoid and a 13 millimeters here yeah so my cursor's coming and disappearing uh so you know here it, it's like at the end plate it's it's nothing and then suddenly um uh, now at the end plate i think it remains zero it, it, it's these values and uh, this one is at 13 millimeters it, after a certain distance um it it uh it increases uh, he, he kelly is using in the experiments the cgs unit so he's using uh, gauss as the um, the unit of uh, magnetic flux density, rather than Tesla, which would be the you know the pra practical one, the SI unit. <clears throat> so okay, you know we could argue about those small values, but there's nothing major, majorly surprising there, and and we, we're just looking uh, uh, to to see that we can measure the magnetic flux de density, and it, it does vary. So some of the results, by the way, later on like we might have two tests which faraday says gives exactly the same results and most of the academic papers say that but kelly would show a very slight difference between them because of these small variations uh you know in in b as you go towards the center of the disc and so on um and uh, you know how many lines of of force are cut now i know some of you <laughs> might might object to that but i'll be talking later about this as um as a model you know it, which is useful i don't know if you say to me are those lines real well i i say well you can see the effect of them by putting a piece of paper on top of the magnet and uh, 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 sprinkling iron filings on them and then as the magnet ch moves you'll see the, ch the 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 filings change or 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 uh, as, as you move the field in some other way um so we we, we talk about lines of force which is Faraday's invention, a useful line of line of force and cutting of line of force. But uh, I, I'll be trying to generalize Faraday's law, uh, as uh, Kelly suggested was necessary. He didn't actually do it himself, but he, he gave us guide guidelines as to how it might be done. And by the way, I, I might say now, I could say it later when I start introducing things like magnetic vector potential, but um, I, I'm obviously um, standing on 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 uh, Kelly's uh, uh, shoulders in all the results he's done. Now, I also have been guided uh, quite significantly by Dr. Allen, who I think is, a, is on our presentation uh, here today, who has directed me um, in certain ways. You know, I, I've looked at this, but he said, well, why don't you look at the work of, of J.P. Wesley? So he introduced me to Wesley's uh, work, and we've been looking at the textbook since. And he's also given me some guidelines about... Um, you know how he thinks I might go forward. So, and one of the one or two of the theoretical points we we uh, bring in in attempting to generalize Faraday's laws of induction um, have really been prompted by by Dr. Kelly's um, sorry, Dr. Allen's, Dr. Denny Allen's, um, uh, you know, pushing me in or suggesting that I might go in a certain direction. So we'll we'll come back to that later when we get to the more theoretical part. Now. So the, the concept, uh, through the paper, he has a number of diagrams uh, showing you uh, the lines of magnetic force and opposing effects. So, for example, uh, let's see, the time is, is, is fine. I, yeah, okay. <clears throat> um, if we have a magnet here, uh, and remember that the, the magnet is rotating uh, around an axis through its north-south pole, poles. Well, you see, you must remember that same thing happened again back. Yeah, if um, if if we um have um, you know, a piece of cable here in which um, the the magnetic lines of force are cutting uh, the cable, uh, so we're we're generating um, EMF as we know in in, in general. Well, if you imagine these lines of force, um, you know, starting in the North Pole, going back to the South Pole, the divergence of, 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 of the um, magnetic induction is zero. So they're closed loops and they, they cut these lines. But in order to measure the voltage generated, you have to take, uh, it, it, take it back to a galvanometer to measure. 
say say from the center here uh, back, back to the galvanometer and th those cables are being cut uh, by the um, fields and basically if, if you analyze a b as against uh, dc or cd you'll find that there, there's an opposing um uh, in, induce electromotance in in, in 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 those wires, which basically cancel. So, or, or that's one way. Of, another way of looking at it is, is the lines have cut have cut twice. I don't know why it goes on when I, you know, for some reason or other. Uh, so, so, so what what we're looking at is if it cuts a conductor, for example, say this conductor Fe. Now it would cut that conductor once, so you would get a net non-zero electromotons but in order to measure that electromotons or emf you would have to take wires back to a galvanometer and unless you sort of extended them to infinity here uh, they'd be cut again in the opposite sense and they would cancel out so effect produced on a conductor near a magnet so so that's that, that, that that's kelly's um uh, diagram eight I, I i'm just taking all all his figures you know i, I haven't uh, taken out any one because i wanted to make sure now he he so this business that i talked about just a second ago about uh, the circuit cutting the lines twice now if if it cuts the 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 um the circuit a, an odd number of times you'll get a net emf but if if it cuts at an even number of times um uh, unless it's in the same sense if it's an even number of times in the same sense you'll get twice the voltage or, or four times the voltage but provided uh, in this circuit they're in opposing senses they'll cancel out so if it's twice or four times they cancel out so this is an, a, a diagram i think he put in to try to show that circuit cut twice by lines so here you have the drive shaft uh, ns axis magnet uh, you have galvanometers on both sides just to show it happens on both sides and that will be important when we have a look at dr cummings um uh, video where he attempted to replicate these uh, experiments in in a moment so just remember that on on both sides uh, or on either side uh, now or so my cursor just disappears for some reason or other it does comes back then i have patience so here um you know you have from the center here um and here are the lines of force which are cutting cutting twice as it's basically the same as the earlier one uh but here it's also here cutting cutting it twice even if you have it taken there and you're, you're going back to the other side uh, of the um the magnet there so circuit cut twice by lines the external circuit uh, is is what it, it's called various names sometimes but um it, we can call it the external circuit which is basically the circuit which takes back the current to the galvanometer for measurement because otherwise you, you don't know whether it's there or not um okay so um okay right i i i'm not sure if if, if it's pretty accurate all the time to be taking it um both wires at the center i, th I think you you might really be at a, a radial distance from it but anyway um it's the same thing. So one thing I might mention before we leave the slide is in order to uh, avoid cutting the lines of force, um, you see this cursor has gone again and the same thing happens. Uh, there it is, back. <clears throat> in order to avoid cutting, say here in this example, we're going to the other side. In order to avoid this cutting twice, um, You'd have to take this uh, line back in some very, very strange way, uh, you know, to, to very far, almost to infinity. Um, and similarly, um, in order to ensure that something is cut a number of times, so if you wanted to cut, be cut three times, <laughs> here, let me just see now. Uh, cursor, cursor goes. Well, um, I don't know why that is. It's... Um, here it is. Comes back if you have patience. But you'd you have to have some, you know, some weird um, coming back again like that. We, we'll see some some diagrams like that in the future. But just bear in mind that it's not an easy um, thing just to change the lead in a minuscule way and change the number of cuttings from 
odd to even. It, 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 it's, it's a bit of a complex thing. Now, so just to look at the difference between the system with and without a separate disc, because when the disc is separated by zero, well, you can dispense with the disc already because you have the Faraday generator, which has dispensed with the disc. It just has the magnet and the external circuit. So let's see what, what Kelly's figures 10 and 11. I think these are the last figures of his preliminary experiment before we get into a bit more meat. Uh, although I have given you his results. Uh, so the circuit partially internal to the magnet. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the thing. There's no disc, separate disc there. So uh, the line cuts the conductor once there. You see that? The leads are touching the magnet at the center on the axle and at the periphery. So there, there's a simple uh, generator. It's just cutting, cu cutting the, 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 the lead once. And, you know, this, uh, here it is, my cursor, it's there, cutting it once. Now, the next one is the lines cutting the disc. Well, again, if we separate the disc, so we, 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 we have the separate um, uh, induction system, magnet and separate disc. We find it does depend on um, the geometry of the system. So here, here is a line which is just about cutting the disc. And uh, again, like RD is very, very small. It could be zero, actually, where you're just tipping the disc there. So there's no line cut there. But on the other hand, you might have a, sh a small amount of conductor there being cut, and, and yet a lot of uh, lines of force, many lines of force are cu cutting the disc. So... So the geometry of the external circuit, although it's not a major factor between induction or non-induction, does affect uh, in a secondary way. And that will explain, so, so I say, uh, some of the slight differences in results that Kelly has found between experiments, which um, maybe Faraday said give the same results. So, so just remember, the line's cutting the disc. Uh, can, uh, another line could miss the disc altogether down here, for example. <clears throat> Now, let me see. Uh, okay, so what he's done here is uh, he's just given a resume of the test results. And uh, some of these are, are almost repeated because these are disk tests and these are disk tests. And these are Faraday generator tests without the disk or with the disk right up against the, um, the magnet. Uh, now, but if you bear in mind this whole concept, it, it, it seems too simple to explain. You know, it, it really would uh, flabbergast the populace, the populace more. If you are an academic and you come on to the media and you say, oh, no, nobody could understand this. You have to introduce the cybernetic interpretation of special relativity. You know, the, 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 the populace and the mass media would say, great guy, you're a brilliant man. But if you say, look, it's a simple phenomenon. It just depends on how many times you cut the external circuit. It doesn't sound as impressive. But let's see if that's not a better explanation because it explains all these. So uh, if the circuit is external to the magnet, if the whole circuit spins, the whole thing, you get no uh, galvanometer reading because the lines cut the circuit twice. So the whole circuit is spinning, uh, but but the magnet and, and the uh, disc are stationary. So it, it's cut twice. Uh, if the magnet only spins, now here, here's one of the paradoxes again. If the magnet only spins, they say you should get an EMF, but you don't because the lines are cut twice, either in the disc or the internal circuit, or in the external circuit itself. So, so that's that's the explanation of the first of, of the paradoxes. Uh, cursor going. Uh, that if the magnet and the whole circuit spin, uh, well, there's no relative motion, so you get zero there. So zero, zero, zero. Now, the, the next one is the Faraday generator, where the disk is, is not uh, in the equation, really. So if the magnet spins, now, it, it, you know, they say, well, when the magnet spins, in the other cases, you get zero. So there, and we'll come to this in a minute. But here you do get a, 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 an EMF because the lines are only cut once in the external circuit. If the circuit spins, uh, you get exactly the same. It's just converse. It's relative motion, actually. Classical uh, relativity. Forget about special relativity. It's classical relativity. One moving relative to the other. Galilean transformation. Uh, 
Now, on the other hand, if the magnet, magnet and the circuit spins, well, there's no relative motion. They're all together. Forget about the distant galaxies millions of light years away moving relative to that. It, it's, it's, they're not moving relative to each other, so you get zero. And uh, let's just look at the, the uh, disk tests, specifically concentrating on the disk. If the disk only spins, uh, you get yes, because some lines cut the disk once. So you'll get maybe slightly lower EMF than in an experiment such as H here, where the disk and the magnet spin, where the lines cut the leads, where the lines basically cut the leads once. But if the disk only spins, uh, as I showed you, some lines will miss the disk. So you might get a slightly lower value. But yes, yes. When the magnet only spins and the lines are cut the circuit twice, when the disk and circuit spin, the lines cut the circuit twice, zero, zero. And when the magnet disk and lint spins, no relative motion, zero. So that's a bit of a repeat of what we had before, but it's just concentrating on the disk. And finally, if the magnet and the circuit spin, the lines cut the disk only once. So the magnet and the circuit are, are, are spinning in unison, but it's just cutting the disk once, yes. And when the circuit only spins, uh, well, I, I suppose it's the converse. The circuit cuts the lines once. Um, yeah, the circuit, the circuit is cut. Now, Faraday was unaware of any difference between G and H. So as I said, uh, the difference where some lines cut the disc and the lines cut the disc, you get a slightly different value. And actually, he did not perform K or L. So those are extra experiments that um, Kelly performed, uh, where the disc and the circuit spin, and you get zero, <laughs> and uh, where the magnet disc and lead spin, and you get zero. In one case, twice cutting, and the other case, no relative motion. So, um, you know, we can we'll come back to this maybe in the discussion later, but we, we, we've talked about all these uh, truth tables, which all the people have put in with all the combinations. And uh, I even have it in um, in Wesley's book here, uh, Scientific Physics, which I'll be returning to later. But he, he does go into this and I, I'll be using his basic uh, theory. Um, however, I, I, I don't go along with him totally because I think he, he introduced some contrived explanations of, of some of these phenomena. He was almost there, but you really need a combination of Kelly's um, experimental, empirical, you know, force uh, allied to an analytical capacity. And that's Kelly, such as... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, What's his name? Just forgotten. It. Wesley. So it's Wesley. You need the two allied together, or if you like, the the uh, the Faraday and the Maxwell, or the Faraday and the Weber, if you prefer. But um, now, yeah, he he then uh, I think he had one more diagram, which maybe I've I've decided I'll put the whole shebang, and I've been I've been encouraged as as you may have uh, divined a moment ago by the number of expressions which have have been made to me. Um, but by, by, you know, by people with, with good analytical capacity, th that Kerry, Kelly's uh, papers were opaque. And I couldn't for the life of me understand why they are. To me, they're very clear. They're, they're quite, quite an amount clearer than uh, uh, many of the other uh, papers we have on the subject. So I said, look, I'm just going to go to town, put all these figures on and try to put them down, try to explain them, and then we'll discuss them if necessary later. So... This business is going to be important in a moment uh, with regard to Dr. Cummings' experiments, uh, which, which I'll show you in a moment on a video. Uh, altering the route of the connecting leads, but when the magnet and the disc rotate. So uh, when only the magnet rotates, it doesn't apply. Uh, yeah, I'll put the note. No difference when disc only rotated. F when the disc is only rotated, as the only... Yeah, now let's come to that in a moment. So... Um, so here's to show the complication. If you have a magnet and a disc here, um, and they're both rotating, well, look at this. In this case, um, you're effectively uh, cutting the lines only once because you, you've missed it here. But in this case, um, one, one, two, three. You, you've you, you've hit you've hit the disc and you've hit the cable coming back because you've altered the route. So in this case, um, let's see, this this line is cutting it. You have one, two. 
So you, you you've only cut um you've only cut the leads once here. In addition, but in this case, you cut it one. Two, sorry, I I no. It, uh, the the first the first one the first one let's take the first one as a simple one first one is a simple one so you've only cut it once the, 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 the second one is this complicated thing so you cut it one two three times you see so in that case um you you actually wouldn't get any difference here because you you've 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 just um brought the cable back so let's see can you not find a case where there would be a difference um well basically what he said is that if you can um you know put a kink on the cable and then bring bring it out almost to infinity uh you will say increase the number of times or decrease the number of times that it's been cut that the line has actually been cut by the by the the lines of force and therefore you'll substantially change but if you make just a small kink in it like this you'll make no substantial difference so just remember that when we come to Cummings experiments but there's an important um conclusion uh, that i submit has come to here and that's why i've left at the end of this slide so he says there's no difference uh, in any of these experiments which he's done putting a kink in and bringing the things out to infinity there's no difference at all when the disc only is rotated. It's only when the magnet and the disc are rotated. So as the only difference between these two cases, which are given completely different EMFs, the only two cases um, apply when the magnet is rotated, uh, the field must co-rotate co with it. So, so, so that's one of, one of his proofs that the field rotates with the magnet. Because you see, um, Faraday, Faraday first said, well, look, if I uh, rotate the magnet um, and and the disc, uh, I, I should get uh, no EMF, but I get an EMF. So one possibility is that the magnet is cutting its own lines of force, which are stationary as the magnet moves, it's cut, and that's what's generating the EMF. But Faraday um, wasn't happy with that explanation at all. He, he actually... Con See that it was an ad hoc explanation, and maybe later on he he um, he rejected. We don't know that it's not that's not clear. But that was an early explanation of his, and a lot of the um, academics say that. I don't. know, It's probably split. People say that the field doesn't move with the magnet, or does. Well, Kelly has said that here is demonstrated that it must rotate with the the magnet. There's no other no other possibility. We can start talking about the the experiment that. Um, that Harry showed us the video with with the little ferro fluid that seems to shift around as the magnet moves, or you could put iron filings on and do the same thing. Um, but anyway, here is a, a theoretical process of elimination where <laughs> the only difference is the magnet in in giving these additional effects. So therefore, the obvious conclusion is that the field rotates with the magnet, and all the uh, results that we've talked about in the previous table. Are consistent with that, where we take the field to rotate with the magnet, and we just take the cutting of the external circuit to be a prime factor. Right. Okay. Well, well, well let, let's just get a little uh, more analytical. We'll we'll first uh, just refresh our minds a little, and then see can we go any further. Um, okay. Now, so. What's called Faraday's law is that the um, the rate of change of magnetic flux is uh, equal to minus the uh, electromotance. The minus sign there is is Lenz's law. It's, it's in in the opposite uh, direction. So uh, it's in it's in the opposite sense to the uh, magnetic uh, field which is causing it. So. However, um, here we are. The the EMF is um, composed of two elements: transformer induction and motional induction. So, transformer induction, excuse me, is where you have a variation of the field, the magnetic field, but but uh, the, the circuit is is is, is static. Uh, motional is on the converse, where you have a, a, a static 
constant magnetic field, but you have motion relative to it, maybe by a charged particle. And you can see actually here, um, you know, th these things are ultimately derivable from force because th this is a, um, if you multiply that by Q, you get the Lorentz uh, force. Now, I, I made a mistake uh, uh, recently where I, I attributed, question of definition, I attributed the Lorentz force to only the second term, whereas the Lorentz force is e everything. It's actually Q E uh, plus V cross B. But anyway, so if, if you integrate the uh, electric field in the li line integral in a closed circuit, you get the EMF. So, so, so that's basically uh, that's basically the law. Uh, so so this is this is Faraday Maxwell. It, it, it's uh, we'll show you in a second, and you know this already anyway. How Maxwell's equations are basically the same thing. But um, so I have a few caveats here. Now these are for closed circuits. We have a, 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 the line integral uh, around a circuit here, DL. Now, but open circuits. Uh, and take, for example, a center-fed dipole aerial or the old whip ant antennas that we might have had on motor cars uh, previously. Um, th they evince induction. Uh, and this, this again, is, is something that um, uh, Denny Allen has pushed me in this direction to have a look at these open circuits, you know, uh, giving induction. And what's the explanation for this? So obviously because these aerials work, you know. Um, well, conventionally, they say, <laughs> I think, I think this is what the academics would say, you know, you might get the odd one differing, but conventionally, they say no current flows um, in such cases. And that is how they explain the hooper monstein experiment. Um, and of that more anon, I'll be coming back to that presently, so I'll not say more about it, the hooper monstein experiment. Um, <clears throat> now, and they, they say no current flows there, but I, I contest that. Now, Faraday's law applies for closed, rigid circuits only. So, you know, we're talking about the closed circuit and it's a rigid circuit. And it's certainly not to plasmas. <laughs> Things like plasmas, which are certainly not uh, rigid and they're, they're not closed. Now, again, uh, Dr. Allen has referred me to this um, IETR fusion experiment. Th this is this... Um, magnetic contained uh, fu huge fusion experiment with 35 countries participating in Cadarache in the south of France. And they've been at this for decades and they're getting nowhere and so on. Now, Dr. Allen has said, actually, one of the reasons they're getting nowhere, whether they will eventually is hard to know, but um, is because they're using the wrong um, experiments for electromagnetic induction. They're using the wrong theory. Um, he said they're fools, actually. They're, they're just, they're, they're just, wrong and it reminded me uh when he said that of um, the words of uh puck in a midsummer night's dream oh lord what fools these mortals be so so maybe this is damned to failure it, it, basic on the basic premise that they're they're not understanding what uh law of electromagnetic induction has to be applied now here here's another uh, danger signal uh, and by the way, uh, ju 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 just just by the by, um, so about twelve days ago, we we got some notice. Um, we haven't discussed it here. I suppose you 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 have it over there on the other side of the Atlantic because it originates from uh, the um, National Ignition Facility in California, where where they 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 say that for the first time they've they've. Uh, fused uh, some atoms and they got more energy out than they put in but they're using a laser laser means of, of doing this um now <laughs> and this is by the by but but it's just another skeptical um you know analysis of, of all, all this fusion business they're they're using um inertial containment there and um it, it appears uh, dare i say it that they've used a bit of um creative and accounting to say that they got more energy out than they put in because actually they, they only counted uh, the energy of the laser before it hit the the, sm the small module they, they didn't count the energy that had to be put into the system to create the laser which i think is a hundred times greater than the amount of energy they got out so that was that it is also suggested that uh, this is actually a facility which is um, basically 
uh, uh, military facilities is there for looking at nuclear energy for military means. And they're getting, um, you know, obviously a lot of money. So it's a good PR to be able to say this big thing on the, whenever it was the 5th of December, that they've now succeeded in getting more energy out than they put in. And it's wonderful. So, so uh, it ju it's just an aside. So, sorry, I'm a bit more uh, critical of something else, but you just remind me of fusion. Matter. Now, one more point about uh, casting uh, some doubt on this uh, conventional electromagnetic induction is the Lorentz law for the motional component is basically uh, equivalent to the Biot-Savar law. So you know you you have the V cro uh, the, the the motional component. What I what I incorrectly the other week said was the total stuff V cross B. So with with the um, with the uh, ampere force law. Uh, and the, the B.O. Savar law, you have IDL. So it, it, it's I as the current of a small current element, DL. D, IDL cross B. So B is, is formed by uh, so uh, by IDL as well. well. Well, let's say you have uh, the, the first current element, your test current element is I1 uh, DL. And the second one is uh, I2. So uh, it's I2, it's mu naught over 4, four pi, uh, I two DL cross uh, R over R cubed. Just so, so I don't have a unit vector in there. So I have a, a, a multiply by R above and below. So basically, you you have a triple cross product, and it's the same in, in the the Lorentz law is basically the same as the Bios of R. Now they 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 only apply for closed rigid circuits also. Same thing, same thing. That's why I say do, do is ditto there. Uh, otherwise, energy is not conserved. Um, and a special case uh, of a more general law is required. Now, so if you look at the, if you look at a triple cross product between, say you have three vectors, A, B, C, A cross B cross C, and uh, B cross C is, is, is uh, um, evaluated first, and then A cross the result of that. Now, if you so, in other words, you have I one dl cross I two dl. Now, if you reverse I one and I two, so in other words, if you have I two, which is creating the magnetic induction, and then you put a current element I one in in, in in proximity to that, and you see what the force is. You get one result, but then you reverse it. You 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 put I one to create the magnetic induction, and you get I two with the test element. You get a different value. They're not they're not they're not converse. Because if you have A cross B cross C and you um, reverse A and B, you don't get the same value. It, 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 it's, it's, so in other words, Newton's uh, third law does not apply. F12 doesn't equal minus F21. You, you can see that analytically perhaps most um, clearly by, by looking at the one of the vector identities, which uh, says that this cross product this triple cross product thing is equal to um one of the vectors times the dot product of of the other two minus one of the other vectors times the cross product of the other two you know that, that you probably, that's one of the vector identities and if you look at that and you switch around a a and b you don't get the same result in general you know unless the, ve the vectors are at 90 degrees which make it trivial uh, so the same thing if you if you reverse i1 and i2 you um you don't get a, a compliance with Newton's third law of action and reaction, and you don't get energy uh, conserved. So, so again, uh, they're restricted, and we need a more general law. And Kelly, now I've gone a bit further already, but uh, Kelly, actually, I think Kelly might have made a small solecism as well. He he, he said in his paper uh, that this Faraday law only applies to the transformer part or something, or is they, no, he isn't saying himself. He said they claim that it only applies to the transformer part, but I think no, they claim it applies to the whole lot. So this E is the same as that. So, so there we are. But anyway, so I'm already going further I into this, and um, but but he did say he said, look, I've done all these experiments, and here are my results. And in order to get a, a generally applicable law, we need to go further. The the laws we have at present. Uh, apply in many many cases but they're not general laws so he, he had the foresight to say that so 
So I say, uh, let me see, what do I say? Kelly's tests that had magnetic lines of force cutting a circuit in opposite directions through. Yeah, this is another experiment he did. What he did he is he, he got a, a cable like this, but then he doubled it back exactly on the same path, uh, almost to a closed uh, cable. And he found that the cable produces no EMF. And that, that's another proof. They, can, they cancel out. Um, however, there's, there could be a large alteration of flux. Uh, in such a system you alter the flux and you don't get any emf because they're cancelled out by this doubling back so that's one hint i haven't actually put the experiment down but it's in the paper well he has a little diagram i've just explained to you with my fingers it's just exactly doubled back the cable there's another one uh which is the tilly test uh yeah that, 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 that's the one anyway uh, the, the, the Tilly test um, is, uh, is is that there well what what, what he did is he says uh, if you have a, a circuit with a sort of a parallel piece um, where, where there's a fixed uh, cylindrical magnet in the centre of it so there's flux going through that but the other circuit is isolated uh, from it by a switch and then you suddenly switch it in so the, the whole other part is, is now part of it um, you get um, no EMF, though there's a large change, uh, a, a flux change, through switching in a magnetic circuit to a stationary one. So, so they're, they're, they're two little, uh, you know, warning signals again. So, again, if, 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 if you don't object to my using these words, um, and Kelly used, he says, there must be actually a cutting of the lines. It's not su sufficient just to have... Uh, uh, you know, flux linkage change. You must have a cutting of the lines of flux to produce an EMF. And furthermore, because of what we've said earlier, a more general mathematical law is required. Now, I mentioned Hooper uh, Monstein uh, a few slides ago. And uh, what, what that is, again, I haven't put it down, but the two magnets um, in opposite directions, one has its uh, north south pole. Um, north on top and south at the bottom and the others reverse south on top and north at the bottom and they're brought together uh it, towards a central conductor now the fields cancel so b the the the, the magnetic induction is zero uh, however you get an emf you actually do get an emf so uh now as i say um, B is zero, but the magnetic vector potential is non-zero, where B is the curl of A. So, 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 that's, uh, so that's there. Now, so we can look at it this way then. Uh, A, the magnetic vector potential, not B, the magnetic induction, is the cause of the induction. And a more general law is required, is needed. Because, um, you know, provided A is non-zero, Provided, it, it, to use a terminology which I've just made up myself, no such thing, but A is the inverse curl of B, you know, because you can get the mix up. Provided that value, that, that, that magnetic vector potential is um, is not zero, you're, you're getting an induction. So what, what sort of law what might, we, might we look at? Well, why don't we go back to basics and look at the ampere force law? And look at the definition in terms of current density of the um, magnetic vector potential. Now, I haven't given you the complete derivation. You can get it in Wesley's book. But I am uh, using Wesley's uh, derivation of the force law to propose a more general uh, law of magnetic, of electromagnetic induction. I'm just looking at the time. Yeah, we want to time so let, let's see now uh yeah well before doing that that's actually my, my my next slide but one so before doing that let's complete kelly's analysis so he's already said look i really think other minds should be looking into um uh what the more general law is because it's there to be found so he, he's pushed us in that direction now there, there are two things which again a lot of the people are saying oh i can't tell whether the field moves with the magnet or not and i can't tell where the seat of the emf is the 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 experiments don't prove it and this is where you know the giant's causeway business again 
you know, it's worth seeing, but not worth going to see. We'll never get an answer. Kelly's answered both of these. He's already said that the field moves at the magnet. Now, he also says where the seat of the EMF is. Muller, Muller did all these very detailed experiments, and he says quite clearly that all the measurements cannot discriminate where the seat of the EMF is. Is it in the magnet? Is it in the disc? Is it in the circuit? Now, Barnett, Pegram, and Kennard, now they were working at the beginning of the 20th century, they said definitively, their experience, that it is not in the magnet. Wesley <laughs> says it's in the disc. Okay, so, so, so just to make it uh, more controversial, Kelly says it's in the magnet. Uh, because um, a voltage is recorded between two points on the conductive magnet's periphery. So again, conductive, uh, talked about this earlier, remember the conductive periphery, uh, at different axial distances from the center. So you get a different, different potentials as you move from the axle to, to the periphery. And he, he claims that Muller's tests probably didn't show this up because they use totally ceramic magnets. So, uh, so for what it's worth, he says the seat, which is basically the the cause, the, 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 the be all and end all, the raison d'etre uh, uh, of the EMF is the magnet. That, that, that's essential. That, that's probably, you know, if you almost never came to this question, you might guess, you might have said that in the first place. But all these experiments, which seem to be contradictory, seem to uh, uh, deny that that was so. And, and Muller said, I cannot tell. Experiments cannot describe. Kelly says, yes, it, it's in the magnet. Now, yeah, so I, I, sorry, I have one or two more slides before I come to the, <laughs> the revelation of what the general law is, so I suggest. Um, now, um, possible obje there are two possible objections to claims of, of the centrality of the external circuit because people have um, talked about this. And by the way, one of the papers, which I think Harry referred to in, in, in one of the links, does talk about the importance of the external circuit as well. He appeared to be just repeating experiments which have been done already, but um, but anyway, he, he he did come to this. Maybe not in the same way as Kelly has. He hasn't concentrated on it and the number of times that you're cutting the, the lines of the external circuit. But uh, Muller's tests with metallic shielding of the external circuit appeared to make no substantial difference. So, so they say that. Well, they say, well, the external circuit isn't the main cause because it made no difference when, when he shielded it. Well, the F, his shielding uh, experiments can be looked at, you know, where he had these cores and yokes and all that. The efficacy of a shielding may be questioned. Some of the pe papers say, actually, you cannot shield the external circuit properly. You'd actually need an, an infinite uh, cage going out to infinity because, um, you know, you, you're just getting the lines coming back. And his, his small shielding systems may be questioned. So that may be one answer to, 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 to that uh, To that basic objection. Now, there's another basic objection, uh, which is the practical one, that this guy coming, whom, whom I'm talking about, claims uh, he could not reproduce Kelly's results of varying induction through changing the lead positions. Now, let's just, I think we have the time. It's, it's five past four. It just, uh, so we'll, we'll spend seven and a half minutes just looking at that because I, I think it's instructive. And th this gentleman is extremely interested in, in Kelly's work unlike a lot of people who dismiss it. Uh, he, he has a PhD from Cambridge University and uh, he has a consultancy company in California now. And uh, it, it, quite a simple experiments, but I'll, I'll see, can I get the link up now? Uh, I think they're going to be advert, uh, uh, advertisements at the beginning and I, I hope I can quash those, but they'll last maybe a moment or so. <clears throat> Maximize that. Yeah, th these um, these ads, I, I I can't go rid of them because. Yeah. But I, I presume Franklin, uh, you can see you can see everything now on the video. Yeah, we can see everything. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you for confirming that. Okay, starting now. Uh, 
1998. But A.G. Kelly claimed that there were some things that Faraday missed when he did his Newton experiments. Now, the A.G. Kelly paper is um, here, and uh, I've got a copy of this on the website, which is um, given in the bottom of this video. Uh, so you can go and get a copy of the paper, and also, uh, also you can see a biography of A.G. Kelly if you so wish. So anyway, moving on to the experiment, what we have here is a uh, repurposed electric drill acting as a motor, which will rotate a disc, which is this disc here, and the disc is rotating in front of a bar magnet. Uh, this bar magnet is a ceramic magnet out of a loudspeaker, and I've put um, a couple of pole pieces on it, uh, mild steel pole pieces, one here and one here. <coughs> and this is an exact replica of the magnet that Kelly used this experiment. And so, um, when the disc rotates in the magnetic field, uh, it should give us a EMF um, generated across the disc, and that will be recorded on the meter here. So let's fire it up and see what we get. I'll start the motor. You can see it's doing about 580 RPM, and you can see that the generated EMF is about 5.6, about 3.9 millivolts or so. And that's the straightforward parallel uh, disc. The interesting part is you rotate the magnet at the same time as we do rotate the disc. Now you would expect this would not generate an EMF because now rather than a disc cutting the lines that form the field, both the disc and the magnet are rotating together, so there's no relative motion of the conductor to the field, so there should be no EMF generated. <coughs> same shaft, so you can see as I move it back and forth, that the magnet and the disc co-rotate. So now you would expect that when I start the motor, we would not observe an EMF, uh, because the uh, magnet and the rotor are going together, so there's no relative motion. And you can see the brush here is uh, where the EMF is picked up. Uh, one contact is on the brush, the other contact is on the metal bearing in which the shaft resides there. So let's start this up and see if we can get an EMF or not. <clears throat> Surprise, we do get an EMF. It's doing 625 RPM and we've got about 3.9 uh, millivolts of EMF. So uh, that's about the same uh, EMF uh, unit rotation that we had before. So uh, this is the Faraday paradox. Faraday first observed this and uh, this is duplicated in his experiment in 1851. Now the question is, how could this be? How could it be that you get an EMF even though the magnet's rotating as well? And Faraday came up with the idea that the magnetic field does not itself rotate, but rather is fixed in space. Um, he himself wasn't very satisfied with this explanation, um, but uh, that's the explanation he gave. We have some more modern explanations of the Faraday paradox, uh, which are based on uh, the way in which Maxwell's equations are interpreted. And so if you put the correct interpretation of Maxwell's equations, it is possible to predict that this will happen. Um, but what you must remember is that this was one of the original experiments on which Maxwell's equations were based. And so it's not really surprising that it, it obeys Maxwell's equations. Um, so anyway, um, that is the, uh, that's what Faraday found. Now, let's investigate uh, what Kelly said. And Kelly said that if you were uh, group the magnets, if you route the uh, wire through the magnetic field that's rotating, uh, then that will change the EMF that we measure. So let's see if that's the case. I'll start it up. <coughs> there we have about 630 RPM, 4.05 or 4.1 kilovolts. Uh, let's see what happens when we heat out the wire. Now this is the wire that's uh, connected to the duct. You can see if I move it around the magnet like this. It's a transient because I'm moving the magnet to the field, but once it settles down, it settles down to the same voltage as that before. So we can come straight out this way, then that. Same EMF, or we can come straight out. 
say in the ENF. Now, uh, it was chemistry that the ENF uh, claims the magic. Well, you should be able to buy a label to make the drug chemistry It's a shame I'm unable to replicate chemistry because were they true, it would have some very profound implications. Uh, <laughs> we could have a new energy source, we could have a new space drive, we could have more mundane, we could have a um, brushless hollow polar motor, which would be a huge commercial value. Um, and uh, for some reason, it doesn't work when I do it. Uh, Kelly reported that altering the routing of the wire made a big difference for the co-rotating magnet, but did not make a difference when the magnet was stationary. And that we would expect, um, because if you put a wire in a static magnetic field, it won't have any EMF generated in the wire. But if you put the wire in a rotating magnetic field, um, then you will generate the EMF in the wire, and that will uh, change the EMF measured on the meter. Uh, but it's not the case. In my rig, at least, uh, I find that uh, I find the exact same results that Faraday himself found. Faraday did not report that uh, the EMF changed routing of the wire, and uh, I don't report that either. So um, if anybody is interested, I've got A.G. Keller's original paper on my website. Also, I have a biography of the man. He was a very respected, well-known engineer. And uh, it's, uh, the website is at um, emmanuelavionics.org slash Faraday. Um, it says that there should be a link to that in the comments here for this video. So uh, if anybody uh, wants to go and look at that, I've also done a proper write-up of the experiments, so all the paperwork is available and the dimensions and things. And um, so uh, I'd very much like to hear from anybody who can replicate Kelly's results. Uh, I could not, uh, but I would love it if somebody could. So um, anyway, that wraps up the demonstration for today. Uh, thank you for watching. So let's see, can we... Um... If I got rid of that, good, we're back. Yeah. So uh, th th that's what I referred to at the beginning also. And um, again, uh, perhaps the answer is uh, he appeared to move one lead position only moderately, thus perhaps not materially varying the net line cutting. Now, you'd have to look at all the geometry there, but uh, I think perhaps he hasn't done that. And... Um, I was toying with the idea of maybe discussing this further with him. Obviously, I have his his, his uh, contact details. He he did say he 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 would like to um, uh, be contacted by people who who had replicated Kelly's experiments but got positive results uh, when 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 the for differences when the external circuit lines were rerouted. But um, anyway, I, I think perhaps one one might uh, you know one might argue that he he it appears he's radically moving the cables, but he's only he he's 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 only moving them you know vertically or horizontally, and he's not um, effectively um, varying the, the the net line cutting uh, the number of times it's cut. If you remember the early the earlier diagram of Kelly, I think it was you know uh, one of the figures, figure eleven or twelve. Okay, so without further ado, we, we'll try to get this, my proposal for the general law. Uh, here it is, yeah. So, um, so t taking Kelly, uh, sorry, rather Wesley's uh, analysis of um, the Ampere fundamental law, uh, force law, and um, also the, the definition of the uh, magnetic vector potential, in terms of current density and so on and distance, one gets something like that, that the EMF is equal to the negative of the rate of change uh, of the uh, magnetic vector potential A um, uh, integrated over a length. Now, I've, I've actually got rid of the um, circularity of this integral. This is general. This, this is just a small element, DL. It could be closed. It could be open. So, so this is, and I've just, um, so, so what, what he, what he puts in, he puts in the full expression here, which is the partial derivative of A and, um, A times, uh, V dot, dot nabla, and then A dot nabla times V. He says, this is frequently in academic textbooks omitted, you know, for this type of uh, relationship. But anyway, that, that's the general, 
uh, law of electromagnetic um, induction, which we might uh, we might use, and and we can apply that to practical problems. But just having a look at maybe uh, a special case. So let's convert the um, to a closed line. So we we make the integral of the line a, a closed circuit. Um, uh, and there, then we can convert that closed circuit uh, loop to a surface integral using Stokes' theorem, where the circular of, 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 of a vector, say, x, well, let's say, I'm not going to use a, but, well, okay, a dot dl is equal to the surface integral, double integral of curl a ds. So if we do that, uh, we, we, just, we just get that, you see, e is, is, is the curl. Because we we we've, we've put in a, a circular um, line integral there, we convert we just the curl of it, and it's the curl of the right hand side there. The ds, not dl. <coughs> D, ds is 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 the surface area, and it's like a normal. Uh, the, the vectors in the direction of nor the normal to the surface. Or uh, for constant v, let's take v not varying with the uh, dimensions. And using the, the fact that B is the curl of A, um, we, get, we get this. Uh, e, e is that, the, the integral of, of the electric field times DL, which is curl, uh, curly uh, dot DS. Uh, so we, we've just used Stokes' theorem there again. My, my cursor just disappears at an important part where I, I need it. Uh, and then it should come back in a second. And then... Uh, we we just put in the uh, the the right hand side of, of this bit, knowing that since v is constant, this term goes out. So we just get that, um, and uh, so so it's the curl of all that. But the, the curl of a is is b and so on. Um, and then uh, so so therefore simplifying we have that where we. We use the capital. This is Stokes' uh, <laughs> fluid dynamics uh, notation. We put a capital D, uh, B by DT dot DS, and and uh, say so. So curly, if you like, is equal to minus. It's like the Faraday equation with a capital D by DT in it. Um, so um, yeah, uh, and. Um, it, it, which is basically the, the Faraday Maxwell law with the with the total differential D by D capital D by DT is the partial differential plus V dot nabla, which which I've talked about. It's the Hertz system uh, of, of of endeavoring to um to render uh, the the uh, Maxwell equations um invariant uh, with with the change of coordinate. By using Galilean transformation, so I've, I've, we've talked about that before. But it's funny how all areas of of physics, once so I maintain, you might be on the right path. You find a lot of things are coming together. So anyway, this bit between these lines is a special case of the general law, which is the um, the Maxwell uh, Faraday, the Faraday Maxwell law, which works in many many cases, but it's not in all cases true. Yeah. So, uh, conclusion. So let, let, let's go to conclusion. <clears throat> just put your cards on the table and don't uh, shilly shally. Just say the lines of force do rotate with the magnet. Earlier attempts to explain away apparent non reciprocity between magnet and conductor. First, first sentence of Einstein's special relativity paper of 1905 are osseous. They're, they're, they're not of, 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 of really uh, much consequence. The EMF uh, requires a net cutting of lines of force, not just a cutting, because it, it may be cancelled out by a further cutting in the opposite sense. The cursor going again. The Faraday, there it is. The Faraday generator phenomenon caused by cutting of stationary circuit by rotating lines of force not magnet cutting its own lines. Well, that, that's basically uh, a corollary of, of, of uh, the first part there. 
Magnet uh, rotating near a stationary disk gives differing results depending on distances and geometry. Well, that's a secondary effect. I talked about it, that earlier. So if you have, um, you know, a geometry where, um, where, where, where the disk is stationary and the magnet is, is moving and you, you, get, um, you get an EMF, well, um, it, 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 it does depend on the geometry. You, you can get slightly different voltages. You, you'll get an EMF in all cases, but they may be very slightly different. And, you know, uh, Kelly talks about cutting some of the lines of force as against from cutting all the lines of force. Uh, and that may, may not be something that, that Faraday uh, looked at. You know, and most of the other people, it's either a one or a zero. It's either induction or non-induction. It's not maybe 99% induction or 90% induction. Is against 100% induction. Induction, unipolar induction is a classical relativity effect. So, you know, again, people are people who want to disprove the special theory of relativity say, okay, special theory of relativity is disproved by unipolar induction. Well, actually, unipolar induction is quite consistent with classical relativity. You know, using Ga Galilean transformations and moving a relative motion. Once you have, so for example, we talked earlier about the reciprocity of the circuit moving with, say, the magnet and the disc uh, stationary, as distinct from the circuit changing and the magnet and, and the uh, disc moving. Exactly the same same effect. Once you have uh, brushes to take up the contacts from the circuit and you can have them moving independently, it's a relativity effect. So so these people who are, who are bringing in are probably incorrect. Um, it's a relativity effect, classical relativity. And we need to generalize Faraday's and Lorentz's law uh, for example, Wesley, which I've proposed, and um, he, he said that the flux change, and we, you know, we, we indicated this by the A field as things from the B field. The flux change is not the cause of the EMF, but merely a concomitant. The vector potential is the cause, and to think otherwise is actually confusing correlation with causation, which is a common error in our modern world, uh, not only uh, in common uh, views uh, of, of the man in the street and uh, the media and the politicians, but unfortunately also academics to confuse uh, correlation with causation. And uh, okay, I, I, I'll bring the matter to a close now and Rather than just finishing now, I'll just give one more. <laughs> I'll give an afterword. Uh, I sometimes quote this uh, as, as an afterword. Um, um, Orville Wright, one of the pioneers of um, heavier than air flight, uh, you know, the Wright brothers experiment and so on, flight. He, he said, um, if we worked on the assumption that what, what is accepted as true really is true, then there would be little hope for advance. So th thank you very much for, for your attention. And I'll, I'll hand back to Franklin to take control of things. All right, Ian, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a number of people um, who have joined us in the live stream. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a number of people. At the moment, I'm going to have um, to mute other people out. In the live stream. Um, thank you very much. Let's see here. Yeah, we've got to have people not play there. Uh, okay. Yeah, we had a little echo there for a moment there. But let's see whether I can add people on here. And uh, so if, uh, if you like to add people on here, yeah, I'm going to have to mute off everyone. So if you'd like to uh, speak, uh, you know, uh, please raise your hand and uh, we can go ahead and uh, put you on there. Um, let's see here. Um, but I guess I kind of had some comments. So, um, and my comments was, you know, I am concerned about whether the, uh, the results that uh, Kelly came up with are, are replicatable. So, you know, we showed the one video and that guy said that he couldn't reproduce it. And uh, the other 
one with the Emmanuel uh, avionics. Uh, his comment also was that um, he tried to replicate it and uh, couldn't uh, replicate. The results were moving the magnet only produces some results so that's that's concerning to me um but uh, you know i did see it was interesting in the paper results that there was the one graph uh which showed that when you rotated the magnet and the disc together that you actually that you did get a difference that you actually got more voltage than if the disc was stationary so uh in, in terms of the actual data shown in the paper you know i think that one showed that uh, there was an actual uh difference with the magnet rotating although not really in, in the kind of the sense that that we would expect so uh, what do you think of that ian okay i i, I do apologize because I, i'm looking at some of the comments and i think um if one looks at the recording of this one doesn't get the comments but anyway that's my excuse uh so you were saying um because i miss a little franklin uh that some difficulty in replicating uh the, the experiments um and you were saying something about um when the magnet moves with the disc uh you were you were questioning what were you whether that would give a different value um as a thing from if the magnet were stationary yeah, that's the thing that was really not expected. I mean, if you are, uh, whether you're rotating the magnet or not, really shouldn't make any difference. But uh, the paper showed that if you did that, that you actually got more voltage, right? So not it, it depends uh, if it was for the Faraday generator or for the general case with the disk separate. Because um, let me just think now. With the um, with the disc separate, if you rotate the two in unison, you get a voltage. Now, if you, um, but then in that case, the, the the graph showed that there was actually more voltage versus the disc being, I mean, the magnet being stationary. I guess. So if, if the if the magnet is stationary, I and mean, the this disc part, is. Uh, Figure three, magnet test. Okay, so we may have to go back and look at that. Figure three. Okay, let's have a look at that. Um, figure three. You're good to pick that up because some of these differences are, uh, you know, as a, they're secondary, but they're possibly quite possibly important. Uh, now, the, the the thing that that I would suspect that happening is that the. Uh, that Kelly's magnet wasn't actually uniform. I mean, it, like pretend instead of using the uh, circular magnet, you used a square magnet, for example. Now, in an in instance of a square magnet, then quite clearly the field lines <clears throat> would be moving with the magnet because it's square, right? I mean, I think that uh, in, in those kind of cases, it's obvious that the field lines would move with the magnet, right? And uh, in yeah. Just like uh, with that, for example, there was a, an example given by Harry where he showed some ferrofluid and you can see the ferrofluid moving around. Once again, I think that would be due to the magnet uh, not being perfectly uniform. So- Yes, you, you did say that the other week, yeah. I'm thinking that, you know, maybe the reason why no one's been able to re replicate these results is because uh, Kelly's magnet was actually not uniform. So if you have a non-uniform magnet, then when you spin the magnet, then you would in fact expect an EMF. And maybe that's what he was getting. And maybe the graph that it's showing that when you rotate both the magnet and the disc together, you get an even greater EMF as perhaps just another indication that uh, his magnet was not completely uniform. It was like he was using a square magnet or something. I, I, I certainly wouldn't discount the slight uh, non-uniformity of it, but I don't think that's that's the big factor at all, Franklin. I mean, in this case, um, when the uh, disc and the magnet are, are rotating in unison, the only induction is occurring between that unit and the circuit. So the circuit is is a is a coil which is inefficiently 
generating uh, or being responsible for this induction or or receiving this induction rather now when when the disc when the magnet is stationary uh the disc uh furthermore has a, has a, has has a rotation relative to the magnet so the 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 disc the, the disc is then um the circuit which is receiving the induction and the disc is a more efficient um means of uh, receiving the induction than a simple piece of wire external circuit so that's basically why um w w when when the um when the when the um when the magnet when the magnet and the disc let me see now when the disc only is moving yes you're you're getting um you, you're getting an induction when the magnet and the disc are moving you're getting um, an induction in the in the external circuit yes but you're not getting any difference between the magnet and the disc so uh, actually it's, it's probably the other way around it's probably that the external circuit is a more efficient means of receiving the induction than the simple disc because you know it, it, it's it's well, it's um, another thing that was uh that i'm concerned about is that the Kelly paper seems to refer to some instances where, I don't know, like the circuit is rotating. Yes. But if it was anything like the demonstration on the video, then there's no opportunity to rotate the circuit with the disks. If that was, the, if that was the setup, because quite clearly there, the, the, the meter is separate sitting on the table, you know, versus the other videos we've seen where they actually stuck the meter on the, the whole rotating bit, the whole meter has to rotate in order to include the uh, meter in, in that situation. And in those situations, we don't see any EMF. So I'm not sure how Kelly even managed to do that. Yeah. The, the circuit with, as rotating. Yeah, well, well it, it, it's it's a good observation, but um, the, uh, the experiments done by Dunning were not, exactly the same as as done by kelly uh, so, so so in the paper itself i think he he probably explains in more detail in fact i think i think he doesn't have the galvanometer itself moving but he has um you know brushes which uh, allow the circuit to to rotate uh, uh, you know actually driven by the lathe um but he do, he doesn't actually go into details about that but uh, but he says that that was done quite uh, quite adequately and um oh, well that may be the difference between moving the brushes only versus letting it have a sliding contact i guess although that has to be sliding somewhere and that was the the meter is sitting on the, the road rotation yeah, uh, unless you move the meter uh, in tandem with the circuit now i i'd have to read the paper again but I, i'm not sure i think i think he didn't do that I'm not 100 percent certain, yeah, but I didn't worry too much yeah. about these details. I mean, you know, it, like he, one would have to say he was dishonest and he didn't do that properly, and he didn't give us the details of that. I, I suppose mean, we need to see a photograph of his experimental setup yeah. because it's really not clear from the diagrams you showed, like where the galvanometer actually is and where the wires are and any yeah. kind of that stuff. Really, yeah. I I, I think uh, we had some discussions about points like that and some other points uh, and unfortunately like it's 25 years have elapsed kelly is deceased and um you know i i said maybe uh, being local i could try to get in touch with <laughs> with with them and try to find it but i, I doubt i doubt if there'd been any, anybody around to give information you are right kelly could have given us more information now maybe we didn't have the same video technology that coming has because Cummings' uh, results have, are con contemporary, uh, so so the, it's a good point. Um, but um, but I, I think um, I think if we take him on his word that that the the circuit was was spun such that there was a relative motion between the the circuit and whatever else was stationary, whether the disc and magnet or 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 just the, uh, the just the disc that that was so he he did that he did that properly um, well we get some other people here like uh, james you always have something to say have we have we clarified uh the situation at all do you think or what how do you think james well uh can you hear me yeah yes yes 
they they don't ground the the metal shaft in contact with the disc to hide the simplest explanation that you have a a uh, lousy electrostatic generator going on let me make a couple points in favor of that uh, <clears throat> first the uh, unipolar magnetic field polarizes the air okay and my work shows that I'm, I, I have to look up if others have, have, have shown a similar effect to my results. This polarized air is in contact with a rotating disk. Then you get the so-called triboelectric effect, which is two, surf, two materials moving with reference to each other, which creates electrostatic charge. Uh, this whole, I would call it hoax, of, uh, of, of the uh, induced EMF in the disk from center to periphery is probably just Coulomb charge uh, separation do, uh, of like char uh, Coulomb separation of like charges as occur in the Van der Graaff type generator where you have a hollow a sphere collecting the charge. In this case, we have a disk collecting the charge. So uh, as far to, to sum up, uh, it appears that nobody, uh, or, or let me ask, has anybody measured disk voltage with reference to earth ground to see if we have essentially a lousy electrostatic generator? What are the steps in this generator? A unipolar magnetic field, two, polarized air, triboelectric effect with spinning disc uh, in this polarized air. Triboelectric effect has been shown to uh, occur between uh, 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 two different metals uh, moving with reference to each other, and even solids and gases moving with reference to each other. And of course, the charge carrier would be the uh, uh, in our generator, electrostatic generator would be the polarized air. So I'll 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 stop there. Um, you you don't need induced EMF effect at all because if charge is accumulated in the disc, uh, uh, it will separate uh, to the periphery. And so uh, I I just find it like everybody is. What do we have is an electro a lousy electrostatic generator is the only consistent explanation of the results. I, I'll leave that as a question. And notice how confused and confusing everybody is when, when ignoring the simplest electrostatic generator model. Um, okay, I've thrown out enough uh, trash talk to <laughs> uh, allow others to respond. Well, my, my response to that, James, would be that, you know, are you saying that uh, electromagnetic induction is a fantasy and it's all caused by this uh, electrostatic force, you know, or is it only in this case that that is, the, that is so? Well, uh, let's not get tangled up, Ian, in vocabulary and calling. The steps that I just described could be called electro uh magnetic uh, or unipolar induction if if you want to call it that what i'm trying to specify is the physics and no one seems to, uh, uh, let me ask rather than make it as a statement has anybody measured the disk voltage with reference to earth you know in the old tesla experiments where we see this or even in classroom experiments uh with the classroom equipment of these uh electrostatic generators um, you can see the sparks coming out and so forth and so on, and it's all very wonderful. Uh, these, the voltages that they talk about are all with reference to earth ground. Nobody, uh, has a, anybody grounded anything in these experiments. And by the way, the triboelectric effect could not only occur between the polarized air touching the rotating disk, what about the shaft uh, rotating with respect to, uh, or, or moving with respect to uh, uh, 
either the magnet or the disc, whether they're rotating or not in all of these experiments. And by the way, two different metals can develop an uh, electrostatic voltage or just a voltage between them. Uh, this is a, a common knowledge in, in the field we call electrochemistry. And so uh, there's all sorts of questions which have not been addressed in these experiments. And uh, uh, so all of this talk about whether it's uh, this theory or that theory <coughs> or Maxwell or Kelly or this, that, or the other, it looks like we just have an old, no one seems to have, have excluded uh, that we have simply a lousy electrostatic generator uh, and that's it, based upon a triboelectric effect. Probably well, multiple effects. You know, it, it's hard to, to, to deal with that quickly, but all, all I would say, um, James, is that you know we'd be interested in getting a paper from you or, or presentation to indicate that this is due to triboelectric effect and, and so on. I, I mean, I, I think if I may say so, that... that Kelly, in a way, w would say that this is another ad hoc hypothesis, which, which what was is one is introducing. One say, oh, it's inexplicable the normal rules of electromagnetic induction. So it's actually it's actually caused by electrostatic uh, effects, or it's caused by triboelectric effects, or you know you haven't, or it's, or it's due to an anodic and cathodic uh, reaction because of electrochemistry. I mean, one would like to see some evidence for that. Maybe you're right. M maybe. Maybe it's due to the humidity of the air and um, the fact that there was lightning there a few days beforehand. You know, there are many, many factors which one, one could introduce and one cannot disprove them. I cannot disprove. But I'd like to see some evidence um, for some. I, I must concede that I, I didn't see any um, measurements of the uh, relative um, p potential, if any, between Earth and, um, and the apparatus. But there I mean, you go. Yeah, but that's that's an, that's an, that's another factor. I mean, the Earth is just a big lump of rock. There's nothing special about it. And uh, you know, when when we sort of ground things, we just want to want uh, a, a, you know a difference in potential between any live part and and, and maybe it. Uh, well, you see, the EMF hy hypothesis <coughs> is, is excuse me is that existing charge is being redistributed from center to periphery in the disk, or vice versa if it's spinned, I guess, in the opposite direction. That's the redistribution hypothesis. The generator hypothesis is accumulation of charge with reference to Earth ground. In other words, addition of charge, positive or negative, to the disk. Those are entirely different uh, physics, okay? And entirely different phenomena. Also, uh, when we talk about this so-called EMF from uh, of the center to the periphery, that might be an equivalent representation of the simple fact that Coulomb force dictates that like charges will repel and distribute at the greatest distance from each other, which would be the periphery. So here we again have a point of confusion where uh, different mathematical uh, models are actually uh, different representations of the same thing physically. And, and so we, we have to guard against uh, then arguing whether this representation uh, is uh, different than another or predicts something different when in fact they are mathematically uh, the same. Well, you know, as, as you said, you don't want to argue about terminology and, you know, maybe there's no difference between what you're saying and, and, and uh, electromagnetic induction. But, but I mean, um, I'm always a bit skeptical about, you know, talking exactly what's happening physically at the microscopic level and, and this being responsible for something. I'm looking at a predictive system. Uh, we have a system which I believe is particular. I don't think there's any confusion in it at all. I think we have a system now which works in all cases. It explains everything, and uh, it's it's consistent insofar as as it can be with uh, the concepts of electromagnetic induction. We had to generalize the existing system, but you're bringing in a radical, uh, different explanation. Um, I, I don't well, see any reason I, I, why. I, I would humbly submit 
Uh, well, first, thanks for your presentation. This is one of the best organized presentations we've had here in, in, in a long time. And, and yeah. I appreciate that. But uh, <coughs> I, I would humbly submit this is not merely a terminology difference or uh, uh, that <coughs> we, the person, yourself and others who are right on hand here now in this forum, uh, nobody can chime up and say that anyone has grounded anything to exclude the uh, accumulation of charge and that we have a simple, lousy electrostatic generator uh, uh, based upon tribal electric effects uh, is very telling. That's not a terminological difference. That's a fundamental methodological difference. <coughs> I see the well, point. well, I, I, I think um, experiments could be done uh, to see whether it made any difference at all. Um, I, I think it's, it's, and by the way, thanks very much for, for these comments. I mean, they're, they're, they're certainly stimulating. But um, I think it's quite possible that they're irrelevant and they would make no difference whatsoever. But we don't know. They could, they could uh, put the kibosh on the whole lot, as, as you're suggesting. They would have to be done to see whether, whether there were any substantial variations on, on the results because of them. Yeah, I would say that uh, there, there is something to say that might not indicate that. Now, the first comment would be that the magnetic field actually does not polarize the air or the surroundings, at least in electrical fashion. So you put a magnet there, uh, that's not going to cause any charge uh, separation. So I don't know uh, why James would think that it would. I mean, we get a magnetic effect. I did an experiment to show that. That just with the with just in the presence of a magnet, you could get a uh, charge separation. Is what you're saying? Yes, uh, that uh, uh, with the unipolar magnetic field, uh, uh, electrons and protons of opposite charge, of course, <coughs> were both moved in the same direction but that the electrons were moved further, which indicates polarization of the atoms, okay? Uh, so maybe I'm the only one that had that result. I uh, don't know whether other people have studied whether air can be polarized by the presence of a, mag a magnetic pole. Yeah, that would be interesting. That's not something that I've heard about. Now, your, your, your claim that it might be tribal electric might be interesting because yeah, there's two things rubbing against each other. So uh, that, that always uh, uh, can cause that particular thing. Although we were talking about two metals here, so you think the uh, tribal electric effect would be quite minimal in that case. That, well, what? you have the brushes, which could be different metals rubbing against each other. You have the, yeah. <coughs> the shaft rubbing uh, uh, against the disc and or the magnet, depending upon which is moving. And so, uh, you know, the, these experiments are extremely, uh, I mean, this is not the way to show magnetic induction, okay? <laughs> it, it's just simply not the way to do it. Well, well what, the is, the way, is, what is the way then? What is the way, James? I mean, you're, you're introducing so many parameters. Uh, we don't know the effects of these. And, you know, if these were actually, you know, significant, we probably would get results all over the place. Um, I mean, this I, may justify the earlier comments that this whole question of unipolar induction was so unfathomable that, that you just might as well give up and it doesn't conform form to the ordinary scientific method. And, and maybe maybe if that were indicated, well, then you're right. There'll be so many factors that you haven't taken into account. We don't we don't get this. Here is um, one attempt at um, a reasonable theory which predicts the, the results. Uh, it, it, it would have to dismiss um, the points that you mentioned, not not dismiss them in principle, but dismiss them as being secondary or tertiary, very, very small effects, which take part in, in any experiment at all. I mean, any experiment can be subject to such analysis that there are all, all other effects which could have, could have, you, you've only you only dealt with one or two. There could be others which, which you could um, look, but we'd need some experimental evidence that they were significant. And, uh, you know, those experiments would have to be done. Otherwise, we're just speculating. Well, it's sort of funny that all you need is a wire with two alligator clips on each end to attach, let's say, the shaft 
uh, in the video, the shaft was the uh, one pole that went to the meter uh, to connect that to earth ground. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, the fact that nobody has done that is is like when you look at the uh, just go to Wikipedia. Well, what, that's what, what I did what recently, that, you know, about, with all of the wonderful about? presentations. It's, uh, uh, I didn't get and, that. I think I'm kind of speaking. I, I found that the elements in electrostatic generators are all present in these experiments. It's amazing. They're all there. And yet so, nobody so, so points expect. this out. What would you predict if you grounded the 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 rotating pole? What would what what would you expect? What is your prediction? Well, I would expect that you you'd find uh, an accumulation of charge in the disk, a voltage. What what uh, all all of this other work is saying implicitly is that there there would be no voltage. Simple. That could be done. Uh, you know, right right now by anyone with the equipment to do this. But but when I when there's no voltage so say the magnet the magnet is moving alone and there's no voltage, what would be your explanation? You you, you said that you would say that there would be a voltage induced by electrostatic means, I, I understand. So how would that fit in with the actual results? I, I, I'm not sure I'm predicting that at all. So what are you predicting? That, that the result will be all you over see, the place. If, if, if the magnet, as you just said, Ian, if the magnet alone is moving, <coughs> and as seems to be the case, the magnetic field, whether it's A, uh, you know, the vector potential or, or, or the B a vector, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, is, is really not cha changing because the magnet is symmetrical, then, uh, then uh, uh, you, you still have a, a unipolar magnetic field which is going to polarize the air and uh, uh, and a triboelectric effect with the rotating disk and the way to determine if you have redistribution of charge from center to periphery or accumulation of charge in the disk is to ground the shaft or the center of the disk as shown in the video which was not grounded, but one pole going to the meter was attached to the shaft. And we're not men mentioning the metal to metal effects, which uh, just without any movement create a voltage if, if okay, with that. two different metals touching each other. If you did that, James, and you got no difference at all, would you be convinced that what you're suggesting is not relevant, that it's, it's, it's a, such a small uh, magnitude that it's not relevant to these experiments. I yes, I I, I, I I mean I really have to rethink. But what I want to know is, do we have <coughs> have a lousy uh, electrostatic generator going on here? Because if charge is accumulated in the disk, it will disperse to the periphery and mimic an electromagnetic force uh, within the disk. You know the radial. Uh, Really uh, diverging force from the center that you all have been talking about for these weeks now, um, and uh, you know, so that's a huge, uh, a huge, uh, 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 I, I, yeah, that would require a lot of thought. What I want to know is just simply: do we have a, a, a an electrostatic generator going on, or or not? That's a simple thing to. Uh, to test in any of these experiments. And I'm just amazed that nobody going back a hundred years has done this. Uh, you know, maybe they're so uh, enchanted by the mathematics of Maxwell and the Lorentz force and all this and that, that uh, they just didn't do the obvious experiment. You know, like if a kid walked in the room and say, hey, daddy, your apparatus there is the same, has all the same components of an electrostatic generator. Is that what you're doing? And daddy would have no answer for him, for the little kid. I, I think I've made my point. I don't want to. You've made your uh, point, certainly. And, and uh, yes. we could it probably we're coming to the end. But I, I think I think that might be a bit of a fixation with the whole question of, of electrostatic generation. And um, 
you know, again, uh, you, you might say, well, if we have such a generator, we should get it in all cases. Uh, we're not getting it. We're, we're not getting uh, any EMF at all where, you know, the conventional view would say that we should get it. Uh, yeah. So okay. So we've got five minutes left in the conference. So I just wanted to make sure I want to check around the green room here, see if uh, anyone else has any comments they'd like to make uh, to Ian. Does anyone have any comments? You can... Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Let's make sure to unmute you. All right. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Yeah, I just want to point out that, uh, you know, with modern uh, microelectronics, you could put a tiny voltmeter on the disk and minimize uh, the influence of external circuits. That'd be a good way to resolve the issue about flux cutting and stuff like that. Yeah, Bob Gray, he had his presentation and he suggested just actually putting a capacitor on there and then measuring the voltage afterwards so that there would be actually no meter. Even yeah, actually, that sounds like an experiment. Uh, there were a couple of experiments by uh, Kennard and Barnett uh, in the early 20th century that did try to do essentially the same thing. Yeah, but I think most of the experiments have never really been able to measure any difference when the magnet is spinning. That's what's interesting about Kelly in that uh, he says that he did see an experiment where there was a difference with just the magnet spinning. So that's that's the thing that has to be uh, replicated. But uh, we are at time right yeah, now. Uh, Ian, uh, you had mentioned Kennard. Have you looked at his work? Uh, I, I've just briefly looked at his work, um, uh, Jim. Uh, do you yeah, think it's specifically um, important? Um, because I think he reached the wrong conclusion about you know the seat of the EMF. Okay, um, and then there was also um, CC Sue and analyzed a similar experiment by Barnett. Uh, I would yeah. suggest you take a look at that too. Okay. okay. Yeah. So thank you. Well, we are at time, so I'd like to thank uh, Ian Cohen for his presentation. And uh, and uh, I believe that will do it. So I also thank you for the rest of the participants. And uh, I'm not sure what our schedule is, but uh, keep uh, keep track of your emails, and uh, we will announce when our next meeting will be. So until then, we'll see you later. <laughs>